Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, I'm talking with Roger and Joey, the two people at Lens Rentals who know the most about which photo gear breaks and which doesn't. As a whole, we receive and inspect around 20,000 items a week, which is just an unbelievable sample size. And as careful as we and our customers try to be, it's inevitable that some of those items are going to break down. Roger and Joey head up our in-house repair team, so they've seen firsthand what pieces of equipment can stand the test of time. Today, we'll recommend some of this time-tested photo gear and get to the bottom of why some products hold up better than others. Joey, Roger, welcome back. Thank you for joining me. Good morning. So starting with lenses, uh, Roger, when we were talking before this about what to discuss, you mentioned Zeiss lenses in particular. What makes those better at standing up to the the kinds of uh, pressure our customers put these things through? Well, it, one of the big things here is it's what it's not. And Zeisses are not electronic. So you've got no image stabilization units, with some exception of some Zeiss branded things that are not true Zeiss. But a Zeiss lens is mechanical. It doesn't have image stabilization. It doesn't have autofocus. And it's well-made. It's solidly built, uh, appropriate to the price, I guess I would say. So, you know, if, if you took all the lenses we have and I said, which of these might still be in service in 15 years, wherever they were, not that we'd have them that long, I, I would say they'd almost virtually all be me- truly mechanical lenses. So percentage wise, uh, the problems that you all see with lenses, the majority are electronic, not the majority, but if you take away, it got dropped on the concrete, then yeah, probably. So the ones that just failed, we don't know why a customer says we're good on the first two days and then stopped focusing or stopped working. Right. Those are almost electronic. Yeah. That's the number one thing I see is it, just an electronic failure. I, I type that note all the time. And on our end, if and when that happens, is that a is that a fix that can be made or anything electronic going to the manufacturer for repair every time? Some things can be fixed, and it kind of depends on the manufacturer and the lens. In some cases, like we can replace an IS unit, that's no problem. However, some IS units have to be reprogrammed using factory software that we don't have access to, so they have to go in. I can imagine being a customer... If I come in and say, hey, I need a lens that can kind of take a beating, I I could imagine maybe the answer only use manual focus lenses not being an entirely satisfying answer. It's not. It's really not. You're going to need autofocus at some point as a professional photographer. I mean, we've only had autofocus since, what, the 80s? I I think that using a non-electronic lens is kind of a specialty thing. Some people, their photography, you know, that works well. Not most. It's... This this is a little side rant. It's it's the difference between photography as a skilled trade versus photography as just uh, a thing you do, uh, well, at least to me. We used to be able to do everything you can do with a camera when it was fully manual. And it takes a lot of practice and a lot of work and a lot of failing to get those images right. So when you look back at like images from the 70s and earlier, and you see the, these amazing images of like motion that was stopped or some crazy moment that was captured that you're like, how is that in focus? That is somebody who is finally, finally tuned into their craft. Like they know exactly what that machine is capable of and they know how to push it to the limits. With the advent of automation, everything becomes easy. Every Joe Schmo in the corner can pick up a camera and make a good photo. That doesn't mean that they're bad photographers. That just means they haven't studied that craft long and hard enough to be able to really make that camera do anything they want it to do. I, I think there's a little different a twist on this, Joey, because you know when I talk to old-timey sports photographers who use telephoto lenses to get great sports action images, mm-hmm. manually focused, they didn't do what people do today, which is let me follow the batter as he runs to first base clicking shots. They pre-focused on first base. Yeah, they worked smarter. And they just pushed the button when the action hit there. So I think the techniques changed over time. And I know a lot of really good photographers who 
heavily depend on autofocus. I know a lot of really good photographers who hardly ever use autofocus. It depends on what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and the, you know, the technological advancements definitely allow us to do things that just right. weren't possible before. So. And getting back to the first part, uh, you know, I kind of left it like I'm afraid some people are going to go, well, if it's a manual lens with no electronics, it's reliable. And that's not the case because there's that's a lot of cheap the case. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there are shitty plastic lenses out exactly. there. Exactly. I'm going to throw out no electronics and I can make it for 180 bucks and it's going to last for a year, maybe tops. Can we drop so, names here? Can we drop names? Sure. Rokinon? <laughs> I think that's that's one, but. Um, you know, I tell everybody if, if it's a boutique lens, if it's a brand new manufacturer, it's not going to last. And honestly, in those cases, it's also not going to be repairable because I'm going to get off the topic a little bit. But if it's Kickstarter, if it's Indiegogo, they got uh, parts for a thousand lenses and made a thousand lenses and there are no parts and there is no repair and it's disposable. And you got to mm-hmm. look at it that way. Yeah. And even just even having no idea about lens design, if you gave like somebody who's never touched a camera in their life, put a Zeiss lens in their hand and a Rokinon lens in their hand. You can, you can tell which one is built better. Yeah. There's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a noticeable physical difference between these two lenses. And we're not trashing Rokinon here. They make some really superb bargain lenses, but you don't get for 300 what you get for 1500. No. And I shoot some Rokinon. I like them, but I always, I consider them a disposable. I own a couple um, and they're great for what they are. And I know that they will not be great forever. And then I will just buy another one. And I think that's where the problem comes in is the person who said, I can get this $300 lens and it's just as good as this Zeiss. And it's not, but it may take pictures as good as your Zeiss for a while. Sure. That's cool. That's what it's for. Okay. So broadly, you know, if you're looking for a lens that will last for a long time and hopefully not need repair, uh, what you should look for is basically as many manual mechanical features as possible and you should consider losing any electronic feature that you might not use as often as say autofocus yeah yeah i think that's true i think the the practical aspect we got to talk about a little bit though is let's assume because most people are going to want image stabilization electronic aperture and autofocus with those being a given then what lasts a long time joey uh the pro series pro level lenses near 24 70s or 70 to 200s yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I, th- I think here's one of the places where you get into the brand is worth it. Not just the manufacturer's own lens, but I consider Sigma and Tamron these days to be, you know, manufacturer equivalent. They're no, mm-hmm. no, no worse. And in some cases, maybe a bit better than manufacturers. So for, for duration, I think the name on the outside is generally worthwhile. Anything else to look out for? When, when you go looking for a new lens, especially these days, you often find that the front element, which used to almost always be just a plain piece of glass, is sometimes now a doubly curved aspheric element. And the only reason I mention that is if you scratch it and want to replace it, it's going to cost a fortune. Almost the price of the lens. It it's really amazing. is. At least, at least half the lens. So used to be a scratch front element we would send in and it was a hundred bucks. It was 150 bucks. And you get into these newer lenses with the really top end front elements and they're the best lenses. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But if you scratch it, it's going to be 800 bucks, 700 bucks. It's really pricey. Yeah. I would definitely invest in good filters for those lenses. Yeah. I think the only other thing I want to add is uh, you're really getting what you pay for. So if it looks like a cheap bargain, it is a cheap bargain, emphasis on the cheap. Uh, there are cheap lenses that can last, but usually they're cheap because they're compromising build quality and things like that. So well, There are also some expensive lenses that go to repair constantly. Yeah, there's some brands I have issues with. I hate to generalize brands, but I think sometimes if, if I'm looking at it and I go, here's four new cutting edge technologies in this lens, I'm also saying, and it's going to break all the time. Yeah, especially first generation versions. Um, you know, I, I'll throw out a name: Sony seventy to two hundred. At one point, thirty percent of our copies were in repair. <laughs> that's the exact lens I was thinking of. That's yeah, exact- but I mean, that's a lens where it had all these new technologies, and they didn't work very well, and they didn't last very long. And we literally, at one point, I think, had one hundred and fifty copies, and sixty two were in repair. So I, I, t- I tend to be Real careful when somebody's come out with 
And in this case, well, it was the first lens with dual focusing motors. It mm-hmm. was the first lens with an aluminum center plate. It was the first lens with several things. And, you know, some of that didn't work well. The very first electromagnetic motors for focusing broke all the time. Yeah. And then they, you know, the engineers went, oh, it's breaking all the time. They fixed it. But second generation never happened. But the first generations broke constantly. Second gens, third gens are usually pretty good, though, when they yep. come out. And there's Ryan's segue because we're about to talk about cameras, and that's what I was going to say on cameras too. Yeah, yeah. And second generation, third generation, that's a perfect uh, place to get into because I want to start with the 5D Mark IV, uh, which I think we'd, we'd all agree and our listeners would probably agree has been time-tested at this point. They've really refined uh, the design of that camera body. How many – I can't get into specific numbers. I've been told not to do that. Do we own – more than 500 Canon 5D Mark IVs? We, we may not have 500 at the moment, but we certainly have owned thousands. Right. Yeah, we've gone through copies. I think at any one time, we don't have quite that many. But we have, we have cycled through, you know, gotten in new, rented for a little while, and then sold used over 1,000, you would say? Easily. Easily. That's where it's important to talk like sample size here. Like a lot of these things we're talking about, not only do we have more copies, but they get more use than anybody who owns their 5D Mark IV. Any non-professionals, anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say, I don't want to give the impression that we think people are beating this stuff up. I, I think that comes up a lot. People ask us this question, like, hey, does your stuff come back all messed up all the time with the assumption that people are using rental gear, like a, I don't know, like a rental car? It's Just pretty like, rare. It's pretty yeah. rare. Happen. People are generally very careful with our stuff and it, it helps that we ship it with like the stuff you need to be careful with it, but it, it doesn't really get beat up very often. No, the, the only exception I can think of is like GoPros. Those do get beat up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of that's the nature mostly, of the thing. Yeah. yeah. That's mostly because of the applications that they're using them tend to leave them beat up. So yeah. yeah, most people are really careful with our stuff and and we get a lot of apology. Lit. I'm so sorry. I scratched. Good. Oh yeah, for like the smallest things, and it gets it gets to me, and I'm like, no, that's totally fine. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, it's that's that's got, just no got way. We're cool. <laughs> so yeah, what we're saying here, I guess, is that you know the the experience we're having here is a lot of use, but not an inordinate, like risky, insane amount of use. Right, and the the five D four is really really held up well. Uh, and the three did for that matter too. It yeah, it really did. Mm-hmm. But I, th- I think the the key things here, neither the five D three or four had a lot of new technology. Mm-hmm. It was stuff they'd been making for fifteen years. It was new sensors and it was some new software and firmware and some new chips. But the camera itself was kind of tried and true. Mm-hmm. And those things were bulletproof. I mean, they really just held up. We hardly ever sent them to repair. Oh yeah, we. I mean, I'd get them. I get them back sometimes, and somebody's dropped them like six feet onto the concrete, or oh yeah, you know, dropped it, left it on the roof of their car or something, and drove off. Or I think I had one. It uh, they were in a car accident, and it flew out of the back seat and hit the front dash. Oof. Um, yeah. And while some of them looked pretty busted up, for the most part, they were still working. I remember one that had been dropped. And the, the little lug that the camera strap goes in mm-hmm. had been bent over flat and the area under that had been dented and nothing else was wrong with the camera. I mean, we replaced the lug in the, the top assembly and it was good to go. It was They've fine. really beat, built those really, really well. That's a well-engineered camera. Design-wise, are there specific features or aspects of the design that make it especially durable or is it more just like the quality of the materials? I think it's not so much, you know, looking at the camera, the design, we take them apart, everything, you know, we take it all apart. It doesn't look that different, but I think the various parts in there had been engineeringly refined. It may not be apparent to look at it, Mm -hmm. but that's the same shutter. For example, they, they'd been basically using for 20 years. It's uh, the same card slots that they'd been using for 10 years. Mm -hmm. That, That stuff was all the same. The top assembly and the prism and everything else were, tried and true. And, you know, I, I'll give you one example, early five series cameras, the ones, and to some degree, the twos, we used to have to shim the prism and the manual focus screen because sometimes they, they were, they were tilted a little bit and it used to be a problem. And then the three and four that stopped. So that's one of those things they engineered the problem away. 
So it's iterative changes. So they, they just sort of generation by generation figure out what was likely to fail with the previous one and, and fix those. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And you could say the same of another camera on our list, the Nikon D750, which is sort of equivalent in the line of the 5D Mark IV if you're talking Nikon cameras. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And and that, that was one that I think we kept those. It was one of the cameras. We, we, we couldn't get them for a while, and we kept them longer than we usually do because we just couldn't replace them. We couldn't buy new copies. But they never broke. Yeah, they worked great. I still love that camera. I still but, take that camera home. Yeah, and it's the same thing, though. It there was no new cutting edge technology in that camera. It was mm-hmm. the same thing they'd been doing. They'd refined it. It was just awesome. Oh, and getting getting rid of the compact flash slot made it even more reliable. Oh yeah. Those pins will bend all the time. Right. Yes. CF card slots were the worst. And, and it used to be that we spent a lot of time in repair replacing broken and bent pins. It was constant. And that's always because somebody put in a, a bum card. Yep. Uh, one of their, one of the holes in their CF card got filled and they put it in and the, whatever was filling it in, bent the CF pin off, broke it off. Yeah. I, I keep getting, I'll get cameras back these days that have uh, SD slots and like, I couldn't get my card in or it wouldn't lock into place. And it's always, 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 always somebody's card has broken a little piece off and it's stuck mm-hmm. down in there and I just pop it out. And the card slot works fine again. Whereas with a CF card, it would have been all the pins and we'd had to replace it all. Oh, yeah. So in general, if people can avoid like pin based media, I can't think of another pin based card other than CF. SD, XQD, that kind of stuff is well, a big improvement. There's a little side bit to this, and that's is the card slot a separate board that you put in the camera and then you plug it in with a flex to the main board or is it soldered to the main board? Yes. Because if it's soldered to the main board and you kind of dram your card in, you tear it off and then the whole main board gets replaced and it's 500 bucks. If you have a non solder one and you screw up the card slot and then for 50 bucks, we put a new card slot in, plug it back in and it's good to go. And that's a big thing that nobody ever knows is my card slot soldered to the board or not. Yeah. And that was, that's the case with the 5D3 and 5D4, right? Yeah. Their, their cards were on, on, on sub boards. That's smart engineering right there. Yeah. Anything that's sort of designed to be repaired easily you know, as, as tough as these things are, something will happen at some point if you own, if you own it for long enough. Are there other examples of that in either the 5D4 or the D750, things that are uh, designed to be fixed either more easily or more cheaply? They're both are very easy to work on. And part of that is, as I like to say, there's, there's plenty of air inside. So there's some space and you take things apart and it's very easy to repair Small cameras, there's no air in there. And it may take you twice as long to get everything out of the way to do a repair that on a larger spacey camera, you you could do because, oh, I can slip it out the side here. It's very easy and I can do it in 30 minutes. As opposed to this camera, I've got to totally disassemble. It takes two hours. Repair techs aren't cheap and that repair is much more expensive. Uh, I'm going to let hell freeze over here, Roger. How about Pentax? Pentax, man, they don't break. <laughs> and I know you love your Pentax cameras, right, Joe? I'm, I'm going to agree with you. They are mostly bulletproof. I hate, hate, hate <laughs> Pentax, but I got to give them that. I got to give them that. You can't break a Pentax, man. You really can't. Is it the one that somebody ran under their sink to show how waterproof it was? Or is that Yeah, one? yeah, that's happened. That, it was either Fuji or Pentax. I don't remember. Was that one of the digital ones? Or were we talking yeah, about? Yeah, it was it, yeah. Guys like, it, Jesus. Jesus. It's, it's like, uh, you know, the, my camera is way waterproofer than yours. And he put it under the sink and washed it off. <laughs> yeah. It wow. Jeez. One of the 645s, the medium format one? No, it was, no, a, no. It was a compact one. It wasn't 645. Uh, 645 is not very waterproof. Let's be real clear on that on the front end. Don't put your 645 in the sink. Yeah. If you're listening and you have one of our 645s, don't run it under your sink. Please don't. Please. Yeah. Well, and I will say the 645s, most of that camera is pretty old tech, uh, even the Zs. And they just slapped a sensor inside it. So, but didn't it have a battery door problem? It, well, I think the battery doors were prone to breaking off. Yeah, because people would leave them open and put the camera down. And, and this is a this is a good example of engineering. I think the very first generation, the battery doors broke off when people set them down wrong. But you had to replace the entire bottom of the camera; it was one piece. Mm-hmm. And then the second generation came out with a normal battery door, and you just popped a new one in. Yeah, just like Canon and Nikon have been doing for years. Yeah, so that's a good example of. 
You know, the second generation is better engineered every time. Every time. All right, we'll take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk uh, lights and accessories. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. All right, so we're talking our time-tested gear, uh, stuff that will kind of stand up to abuse and that we don't have to send to repair very often. And I, I want to talk about lights. And Joey, you have uh, a lot of portrait photography experience. What what lights would you recommend for somebody who's looking for something that will stand the test of time? Uh, my favorites are still going to be Palsy Buff lights, uh, Alien B, B800s, things like that. I don't like the DB800s as much, but the B800s, man, they're cheap. You can beat them around. Like you may have to replace bulbs and stuff, but for the most part, they're kind of bulletproof. And when they aren't, Palsy Buff will fix them pretty cheap. So and they have a really good repair system. Mm-hmm. And there are some lights that are really popular that the repairs are all done in Europe, which if you live in the U.S. is kind of a pain. But uh, Einstein's B800, those are the ones we carry. I love those lights. Uh, and I wish years ago I had bought them instead of the, the lower end Ellen Chromes that I did, that I eventually sold. Were Ellen Chromes, were they the light blue ones? Uh, I think so, yeah. It, because there was one light we had for a while that broke constantly with the least bit of jarring. And when we opened them up, what we found was they had big capacitors, which most strobes do. But they weren't fixed other than soldered to the board. So it didn't take much of anything. And suddenly you hear your light would stop working and there was a big thunk inside. And that was because this, you know, half pound capacitor. Yeah. I remember those. And they, those. Those weren't, those weren't Ellen Chromes. Those were. We stopped carrying it a long time ago. So I've forgotten. Yeah. That was a shitty brand. I'm glad we got rid of those. Yeah. But that's, that's the kind of thing you look at. You, you look at the light and, you know, it gets rave reviews and everything else, but nobody opens it up and goes, oh, look here. You know, we have a slightly different perspective on durability because we have to ship everything. There are some lights that just don't ship well. True. Um, Alien bees seem to ship pretty well. They ship pretty well. As we send out a ton of them, and I don't get very many of them, many of them across my desk. I do get a lot of pro photos across my desk. Yeah. And it's usually either the electronics have burned out, or a bulb has come unseated, or a bulb has cracked. And that's a really good point. I think in general. Big strobes don't ship well because they have heavy things in them. Yeah, yeah. LED lights ship real good. Uh, in terms of flashes, what would you recommend? I know Pro Photo makes a flash. Is it any more or less durable than like manufacturer's flashes? Are we talking like uh, on camera flashes, like speed lights? Yeah, or yeah. Just like a yes, like a speed light. Um, they, they don't. They don't break very often. They burn out after a while. Is that an easy fix? I know nothing about flashes. Like I know it's a relatively easy fix to swap a bulb on a strobe, you know, a traditional no, strobe. Those, those are not bulbs and uh, you can buy the tubes and resolder them in and everything else, but it's not a simple thing to do. It's, it's uh, yeah. You're looking at a full disassembly of the head to do that. It's, it's, it's a pain in the rear. Um, that's one of the things we can do that here, but we often send them in because I don't know if maybe the factory techs have people that just do flashes all day and they're quicker at it. But, uh, it could take us a couple of hours to do a flash, and that's that's a lot of time. Yeah, for the most part, like Canon and Nikon flashes, metal hot shoes, when they break, it's usually somebody's dropped it, and so it's like broken the flash body off of the shoe. And even then, they sometimes still work because the connections are still good. What I don't like are Sony flashes. They're plastic feet, and they've got all these exposed little tiny contacts at the front for their what is it, their multi multi-interface thing or whatever. Those get bent all the time. It doesn't even matter if it's Sony brand, like our Pro Photo for Sony and like other lights for Sony. Man, those break all the time, and I hate them. It, it's the contact design. Doesn't matter who made it. It's just bad contact design. Versus Canon and Icon, tried and true metal hot shoes. They're fantastic. Would you recommend people just stay away from flashes in general? I mean, I beyond like the aesthetic 
decision. Oh, not at all. I, I, I used to roll when I had a full kit before I started, before I started working here and sold it all. I had a Nikon kit with a D3 and a bunch of lenses. And I had at all times, I had a bag with three SP 700s and one SP 900. And that was my to go lighting kit. That's all I ever used. I shot a bunch of magazine work around town with it. It was great. Speed lights are awesome. Well, if you've got time-tested lights, you're going to need something to put them on. How about that segue, guys? I'm just <laughs> ah, good one. We're switching to accessories. So the next thing on our list is my favorite thing on our list, and that is C-stands. If you don't know what a C-stand is, Joe, will you describe a C-stand for anybody who's not familiar? Tried and true solid metal light stands with uh, three legs that usually fold up into like one thing. They're kind of um, kind of like a loose L shape at the bottom. And then a center, a center column. They're almost always either chrome plated or black. They are solid, heavy things. If you don't have like massive lights on them, you don't need it. You don't really need a sandbag because they're just so heavy. I, I think that for some people who haven't seen them, who, who've used just regular light stands, a light stand weighs ounces and a C stand weighs pounds. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably twenty or more. Yeah. They are solid, solid metal things. They are not things you want to haul around without like a rolling case. Probably the only thing in anyone's camera gear kit that they will leave to their heirs. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have three of them in my closet and they, I will never give them up. And you don't have to, these do not need replacing. You could wake up every day and beat the shit out of your C stand with a bat and you'll still probably leave it to your children. You'll need a new bat. Yeah, my my favorite my favorite of my three stands has a big dent in the center center column, which makes it difficult but not impossible to fully extend. And I don't even care. Like I don't care. You know, on the film and video side, I worked in sound stages and they'll have C stands from like the sixties and seventies. Oh, yeah. These things do not mm-hmm. need to be replaced. Mm-hmm. And I hate to like dig into our business, but it's not like we're making a ton of money on C stands. Anyway, we rent C stands, but I would almost say anybody who has a need for a C stand, just buy a C stand. Don't rent C stands from us. Yeah. And the brand doesn't even matter. Matthews makes, has been making C stands from the beginning. Yeah. Avenger makes really good C stands. Those are the ones we carry. They're great. Mm -hmm. They're not too expensive. They'll last you your entire life. An interesting aside for people out there, the C stands absolutely last. We had a horrible time getting boxes that would hold up because we send something in a box, the customer reboxes it, sends it back. It takes a special box to ship a C stand because they break a box to pieces if you don't have a double wall box. Right. Special case too. We send them in like a guitar case. Yeah. I think this is cheating though. I mean, you know, it's like saying a pipe is reliable. It's basically. <laughs> That's true. Reliable. We're talking about just a big piece of metal. <laughs> it's just a huge piece of metal. I mean, I've left them out in the rain before. Like they're fine. Like it does. They, they just, they, they take any abuse you want to get. It's them. the honey badger of camera equipment. See, they're going to be there. <laughs> lightning. So yeah, if there's, high. if there's one takeaway to any listeners here, it's just go Definitely buy some C stands. You should only buy C stands. Just buy the stands. Just look at them forever because okay. they do. Will. How many people actually need a C stand? In, not in many. photo, <laughs> not many. Yeah, in photo at least, not very many. Even in video, you're probably I don't know, unless you're a grip or whatever. Well, Even we'll they see. don't own them; they rent them from grip houses. But. I mean, if you're a portrait photographer and you got a studio set up, uh, and you don't want a wall-mounted backdrop stand, C stands are great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they will never I've move. I've never heard Joey go fanboy before, but man, he man, is about C-stands. I, you got love hate this time. I, I, uh, you know, I hate Pentax as much as I love C stands. <laughs> yeah, today's episode sponsored by C stands, and yeah, I get some sandbags too. Sandbags will last forever. Oh yeah, sandbags. Uh, definitely get sandbags. Oh, uh, we. I think this has come up maybe on the podcast before, but hot tip for sandbags. Uh, we fill ours with steel shot and not sand, and it costs a little bit more at the outset, but it is so helpful. Yeah, don't ever put sand anywhere near a camera or in your studio or anything. Just good. fill it with rocks if you're not, you're not going to use lead shot or steel shot. Yeah, that's doable too. I did pennies once. Um, actually, I still have a bag of pennies at home that serve as a, a, a sandbag. The most expensive sandbag. It's like $30 worth of pennies. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That'll about do it. Thank you guys for coming on. Thank you. Had a good time as always.
Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, Fintex. Again. Go see Stan. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. There will be links in the show notes to all the time-tested gear we recommended here. And as always, if you have questions about gear durability or how to repair your own stuff or pretty much anything else, let us know by emailing podcast at lensrentals.com. The Lens Rentals Podcast is a production of LensRentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at LensRentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote. Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. Pablo Picasso.